With today's sermon in our series, Life Hacks, Pocket Tips from Proverbs for Better Living, here is Senior Pastor Mark Rader. Uh, In in the book of Proverbs, you will encounter a number of uh, stock characters. Uh, You know what a stock character is if you watch some sort of, you know, horrible, uh, you know, kind of satire, B-grade comedy, you'll have like the nerd, uh, and you know what the nerd is going to be like, even if you don't know this particular nerd, right? It's always the stock character. Uh, The mad cat lady, like you know, the character, the mad scientist, right? There's a certain, there's certain stock characters and they're really helpful when you're telling a story because all you need to know is, well, that's the character and now I know kind of what to expect. They're going to act in a particular way. They're going to misunderstand particular things and all that kind of stuff. You're familiar with that? Uh, When you come into the book of uh, Proverbs, you actually encounter a whole bunch of stock characters, uh, and often they're caricatured as well. You see in caricatures at the Easter show or whatnot when uh, someone draws a picture of an individual, but they take one aspect or one feature, their nose or their smile or their ears or their hair, and they kind of exaggerate it, hopefully for a bit of comic effect. That's largely what we have in the book of Proverbs. And one of the caricatures, one of the stock characters that you bump into several times in the book of Proverbs is the individual known as the sluggard. Uh, Great name, isn't it? The sluggard. Uh, It's the lazy person. And uh, the sluggard kind of cops a whole heap of stick uh, in uh, the book of Proverbs because of uh, what they, well, essentially don't do. Uh, and uh, as you may have picked up from even the uh, kind of the title, they don't do anything. Uh, so in chapter 6, for instance, uh, if you have your Bibles and want to kind of flip to a few of these passages in Proverbs chapter 6, uh, verses 6 to 11, uh, the admonition is this, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. You know you're in bad shape when even bugs can teach you important life lessons, right? Uh, It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard, when you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. So they don't do anything, and therefore they are not particularly successful in the things that they do. But part of the reason why the sluggard is made fun of in the book of Proverbs is because they also want all the good things in life. So in chapter 13, verse 4, it says, A sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desire of the diligent are fully satisfied. In other words, the sluggard kind of wants more and more and more, but is unwilling to work for it and wonders why they don't get anything. Right? This is part of the caricature of these individuals. In uh, chapter 20, uh, verse 4, we have another similar statement. Sluggards do not plow in season, so at harvest time they look but find nothing. Right? Now, fairly obvious, isn't it? A fairly obvious statement, but it's also just a little bit humorous that someone would pl- not plow their field, not plant any crops, but still go in the fall and look for the crop that they didn't plant because they didn't plow. This is kind of the typical sluggardly behavior. They also come up with any excuse not to do any work. Here's the famous one in chapter 22, verse 13. uh, 13. The sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I'll be killed in the public square. Therefore, I shouldn't risk it. I'm just going to stay inside. This is kind of the typical kind of sluggardly behavior. Uh, They are ultimately fools, and they have no real sense. Uh, And so all the way through the book of Proverbs, they're presented for us as a negative example, right? This is not the way that you want to live. We want to ultimately be like the wise uh, in the book of Proverbs, not like the sluggard uh, or uh, a number of other caricatures that you bump into. Because if you want to be successful in life, then you should imitate different ways. I think you're with me so far. So the proverb that we want to look at tonight and spend a little bit of time thinking about is actually found in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4. I'll read it a couple times so that you might be able to get there before we're done the reading. They're very, very short in Proverbs. Here it is. 
Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Let me read it again. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. So once again, we have this fairly simple and straightforward statement. It's a short, uh, pithy statement of generalized truth. And we have to be careful, though, when we encounter Proverbs, that we don't make them say more than they ought to. So you know Proverbs, because they're so short, there's only a limit to how much they can say. And so we do have to kind of play around with them a little bit and ask ourselves, uh, what is this actually speaking about? So let me just make a couple of really important um, initial comments about this proverb, about lazy hands uh, making for poverty and diligent hands bringing wealth. Let me just point out that the shameful behavior in this proverb is not poverty, it's laziness. It's really important that we make that distinction clear. Uh, The biblical authors do not suggest in any way, shape, or form that uh, if you are poor or if you experience poverty, that you are somehow on the spectrum of kind of wise to foolish, and that by, by definition, being poor means you must have been a fool. I think it's also important to say that poverty is not automatically an indicator of laziness. You've probably heard this before. Uh, right? Uh, In some way, shape, or form, we can sometimes blame those who don't have a lot because they haven't worked hard. And while there may be some circumstances, instances where that's actually the case, this proverb does not make that argument. So we can't just say if someone is poor, they're obviously just lazy. Uh, That would rule out, say, two-thirds of our world uh, for whom poverty is, uh, has nothing to do with their diligence or amount of effort and has everything to do with systemic problems that go far, far, far beyond anything they can control. So we have to be really careful about those sorts of things. Can I also just point out, though, that laziness is also different from resting. Right? Laziness as kind of a, 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 as a vice is different than lazing around. There's a time and a place for lazing around, isn't there? Uh, I've had a couple uh, pretty full weeks. Uh, I've been traveling a little bit more than I might normally do so. I've missed a couple of my days off. I take Thursdays off. Uh, And uh, if I have a couple of weeks where I miss that day, I'm pretty tired by the end of it. And so this last Thursday, I lazed around. I think the grand total that I got achieved was nothing, uh, apart from possibly drinking a couple of cups of coffee, right? Like it was really low key. And from the perspective of taking care of yourself and overall mental health and physical health, that kind of rest is is a good thing, right? Uh, And and as a a society um, and a culture, we are so fast-paced, we are so driven by uh, immediacy, especially around our technology, that perhaps wisdom might include some lazing around. Uh, that uh, some uh, aspect of wisdom might actually be doing nothing, particularly doing nothing, say, with your phone. Try being lazy with your phone. That might actually be wisdom, right? Like, so we, we need to recognize that this proverb doesn't say absolutely everything about having some time off or, uh, or taking it easy or having a bit of a break. It also is not talking about procrastination. That's probably on the spectrum somewhere, right? I'm not sure exactly where procrastination becomes laziness, but it's not necessarily laziness right at the beginning. It eventually gets there by the time you've had your third cup of coffee and walked around the block the fourth time and checked your phone the 17th time and decided to do more laundry even though you've already done the laundry, right? All that kind of stuff, right? At some point that becomes laziness, but ultimately, you know, we're talking about a very particular type of behavior or shall I say, a particular type of non-behavior. The principle in chapter 10 is actually pretty simple, isn't it? If you want to be successful in life, you should be diligent. You should work away at what you want to be successful at. In chapter 10, in verse 5, there's kind of a a continuation of this theme of, of laziness and diligence. It says, He who gathers crops in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. It's about doing the right thing at the right time. When When the crops are ready, that's when you should go and gather them in. Even if you don't feel like it, there's a time, as they say, for making hay, and the time is when it's ready, right? And so if we want to be successful in our lives, regardless of the sphere, 
right? Most of the book of Proverbs is written about kind of farming and stuff, right? A very particular type of success. But the principle works just about anywhere, doesn't it? Do you want to get good grades in school? Well, the rule of thumb is if you study hard and work hard, chances are you'll be successful. Right? Now, that's a rule of thumb, right? This is the other thing about Proverbs. There are some exceptions to the rule, aren't there? Sometimes you can work really, really hard, be super diligent, and still get really awful grades. That's possible. But more often than not, if you work hard at anything, you will eventually reap the reward, right? And, and can I just point out something really important about this kind of truth? This kind of truth is an, an observed truth. In other words, it hasn't come about by revelation from God, but by observation of God's world. The book of Proverbs, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, is uh, one of the most intensely practical books that you'll find in Scripture. It's meant to be used day by day. I actually hope and pray that at some point during this week and the weeks to come, you will find an opportunity to use this proverb in your day-to-day -day life, right? And they're intensely practical, but they're also quite um, secular. And I know that sounds a little bit weird to talk about something that's in the Bible that's secular, but let me explain what I mean. If you read through the wisdom literature, and the wisdom literature would include the book of Job, um, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, I reckon that uh, the Song of Songs is also wisdom literature. If you read through all of that wisdom literature, you are not going to find a lot of the big themes that you find in the rest of Scripture. You're not going to hear any references to the grand promises of God to Abraham or to Isaac or to Jacob. You're not going to hear the story retold of how God rescued his people from uh, Egypt. You're not going to hear about Moses uh, receiving the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law. You're going to hear very, very little about uh, offerings uh, and sacrifices and the temple and Jerusalem. You're not going to hear stuff about uh, King David and the mighty promises of God to him. And you're also not going to hear any thus saith the Lord's. There are no prophets. There are no angels in the book of Proverbs. Solomon doesn't have an angel appear at the end of his bed saying, listen, I've got some hot kind of new wisdom that you never would have understood except for me telling you. Uh, the wisdom literature is, uh, is, is secular in the sense that just about anyone who pays attention to how God has created the world will end up seeing these patterns. So the underlying theology of the wisdom literature is actually the doctrine of creation, that God created the entire universe, the, the material universe, rocks and trees and birds and bees, not the stuff we see and sense, but also the moral universe. In other words, why is it, do you think, that uh, laziness ends up leading to destruction and diligence ends up leading to success? There's no real reason in our physical universe that that should be the case, right? The gravity has nothing to say about diligence paying off. Why does diligence pay off? We believe it's because God created the world that way. And so when you begin to look around and you begin to see the patterns of behavior that lead to success, you're actually identifying the patterns that God himself has woven into the world. And the whole idea of living wisely is to live in God's world on God's terms, right? If God's world says being honest is the best policy, then the best way for us to be successful is to be honest. Not because we're particularly moral people, not because we believe that the truth is amazing, just because God's world has been designed that way. Does that make some sense? And so when we come to something like this, this is observed truth. And it's quite possible for people who are not followers of Jesus to therefore observe the same truth. You don't have to be a Christian, do you, to realize that hard work pays off. I bet you know heaps of people who have no real faith at all who, who understand that same principle. You probably work with some of them. You go to school with some of them. They work super hard because they know and understand that Hard work eventually pays off. There it is. But if we just need to observe the world to figure that one out, why is it in the Bible? 
Now, why do we actually need to think about this principle any more than we already have? Okay, fair enough. Hard work pays off. Good, that's wonderful. I knew that already. Can we go home now? But it actually suggests that the same principle that works, shall we say, in relationship to our career or to our grades works in other areas of our lives. And it begs the question then, if we are experiencing poverty in any area of our life, it begs the question, are we experiencing that poverty because we have lacked diligence? I'll give you an example. We can talk about physical, financial poverty, but we can also talk about relational poverty, can't we? You ever wonder why your relationships all seem strained and, you know, it's just really hard work and, you know, you don't have anyone calling you up and have you ever had those kind of, you know, little pity parties? And then you realize that you probably haven't been calling anybody up and, you know, you've kind of, you're off Facebook and you don't kind of do all that stuff. The poverty in our relationship is a result of the, pover- oh, sorry, of the lack of diligence into those relationships. You follow me on this? Uh, we can have a poverty of relationship. We can have a poverty of mind. Right? You ever wonder why you can't come up with any good ideas? When was the last time you read a book? Right? When was the last time you read something invigorating? When was the last time you did something to stimulate your mind? Well, if you're not stimulating your mind, you shouldn't be surprised when your mind is a barren waste field. Right? Uh, we, we need to be diligent in all areas of our life. And can I say, it also means that we can have a poverty of spirit. Now, Jesus talks about being poor in spirit and says that you're blessed if that's the case. But can I just say for the moment that I think Jesus is talking about something different there? What I'm talking about here is when we look at our lives as followers of Jesus and we think to ourselves, you know what? Things are not as good as they could be. My relationship with Jesus is not as vibrant as it once was. I don't seem to be learning much anymore. I don't seem to be growing much anymore. I don't seem to be changing much anymore. I I don't seem to be getting much out of the Word. My prayer life is just kind of really hard work. I I can't remember the last time I had a spiritual conversation with anybody, uh, whether one of my friends from church or someone who has no faith at all. Well, the question that I think we have to ask ourselves is whether the poverty of spirit is because we've actually ultimately been lazy and lacked diligence. Here's where I think we need to understand something really important about laziness. Uh, You probably already have, if I talked to you, if I said to you, listen, I want you to picture in your mind a lazy person. Can you picture them in your mind? How many of those pictures included a couch and a remote control, right? You kind of get this picture of someone who's just, he's, he or she is just, just, just barely different from a liquid. Like they're just, they're lying on the lounge. There's no movement. If the remote control fell out of their hand, like I, I guess I just have to watch the rest of this season of whatever I'm watching on Netflix because I just can't be bothered to reach it. There's probably junk food lying around in this image in your head, right? They might even be a little bit overweight as well because they don't even move. You, you get the picture. That's not actually a very good description, though, of what true laziness is. I don't know if you're familiar with the seven deadly sins or the seven capital sins, as they're often referred to. They were deemed to be, in the Middle Age, Church of the Middle Ages, the seven sins from which all others flowed. So they were capital sins in the sense that from them they kind of led into everything else. And one of the capital sins was slothfulness. It was this idea of being lazy. But when they talked about slothfulness, when they talked about laziness as a capital sin, as a deadly sin, as a sin that if you don't deal with it will ultimately bring you to ruin, is not just about doing nothing, but it was about a spiritual apathy that kept you from doing the things that were most important. You know who the laziest people might very well be in our society and culture today? The people who are busiest. The people who have no time for anything. The people who are flat out rushing from thing to thing to thing because busyness has become a badge of honor, hasn't it? I mean, if you ask me, you know, how are you doing? And I say, oh, I got nothing on. What kind of a person am I to have nothing on? Seriously, don't you have a job? You should be busy. Go get busy. 
Whereas if I'm busy, I must be important. Right? Look at me. I am so busy. But in my busyness, am I doing the things that are really important or am I just busy? We fill our lives with stuff. We fill our lives with stuff, don't we? We have to watch Netflix and we have to download that new app and we got to play that weird new game that's out there and we got to watch all those viral YouTube clips because God forbid we miss out on the latest yodeling child or whatever it is that's going on, <laughs> right? Oh, we're busy updating our uh, Facebook status and taking pictures of our lunch. Uh, we're very busy planning our next holiday. We're very, very busy running from thing to thing to thing, trying to do everything all at once, because that's our way, isn't it? Right? There's a time for everything, Ecclesiastes says, and our answer is yes, right now. We do everything right now. We have no sense of balance. We have no sense of margin. We have no sense of doing nothing, really, when it comes right down to it. And ultimately... It means that we are very, very busy doing all sorts of stuff that ultimately leads to a poverty of spirit. I recently got rid of an app on my phone because I realized I was spending more time on it than I did reading the Bible or praying, like by a long way, by a long way. And I was preparing for this message and I thought, well, that would be an example, wouldn't it? There's this wonderful um, piece of art, deviant art, uh, by the artist Dalig. She uh, did a whole series of depictions of the seven deadly sins, and her depiction of slothfulness is, is brilliant. Uh, she's depicted all of the seven deadly sins as women. I, I don't want to read too much into that, just so you know. And the woman who represents slothfulness is sitting on a swing, suspended kind of between heaven and earth, just kind of in the middle of space somewhere, right? Above the menial and mundane tasks of the world. She's swinging back and forth, dressed in blue gauze with feathers, and she is tremendously busy. She is tremendously busy blowing bubbles. Oh, a lot of work. You got to stay on that thing because they pop as quickly as you blow them, you know, right? I mean, to keep a lot of bubbles in the air, you got to stay really busy slothfulness. Her schedule is full. Her schedule is full. She's flat out. But she's not doing anything important. And we can end up, particularly in our relationship with God, particularly as a follower of Jesus, actually slothful because we are so busy with things that are ultimately of no real value. Now, I have to say, I don't know where the road of wisdom is with, say, social media. I, I, I have no idea. I get the whole connected piece. I, I get that whole thing. I think that's, it's brilliant, all that sort of stuff. But somewhere, surely we have to draw a line, don't we? I keep talking. We keep hearing that we're all addicted to our phones, don't we? Shouldn't the church, shouldn't followers of Jesus be the first to say, hey, we know a way out of this? Or are we as addicted? Are we spending all of our time as busy as everyone else, but ultimately not doing the things that will contribute to success in our relationship with God? And see, it's uninteresting, isn't it? Because I think when it talks about grades or about success in our career or getting ahead, even in some times of our relationships, we can be super diligent and we reap the rewards. We get good grades. We advance up the kind of the, 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 the corporate ladder. Uh, we get new opportunities uh, presented before ourselves. We're, we get that in the physical realm. We understand that in the physical realm. But this also, this principle also works in the spiritual realm. And if there's an, a poverty of spirit, is it because we're going through what the great uh, church fathers and uh, many of the great um, devotional leaders called the dark night of the soul, where God seems absent from us and yet we are pressing ever more deeply into him? Or is it because at the end of the day, we've just been a little bit lazy when it comes to that relationship? If we don't put into the relationships that we have with other people, those relationships will end up impoverished. If we don't put into our relationship with God, that too can become impoverished. 
Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. I think you'll be able to use that this week sometime. Hopefully, while you are diligently working away at some assignment or diligently working away at whatever job your boss has asked you to do, whatever it is, I hope you remember that diligence brings success, but next time you are playing that game for the third hour or updating your status on Facebook again or watching the second season of Netflix that you have just watched the first season of, perhaps you might also consider... That just as diligence leads to success in work, in relationships, in school, it will also lead to success and wealth in our relationship with God. A pocket tip from Proverbs for better living. We hope you've enjoyed today's New Horizons program. You can download the companion study guides for each program from the Guy Mayer Baptist Church website. Go to guymayerbaptist.org.au forward slash New Horizons. These are available for each episode or you can download the whole series. Guy Mayer Baptist Church in Sydney's southern suburbs is a contemporary evangelical church seeking to serve our local community and help them to know Jesus. At the heart of all we do is the desire to help people love God in all aspects of their lives. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can do so by the contact page on our website or visit our Facebook page. The wisdom of Proverbs is intensely practical. And the proverb that we looked at tonight is something that's really well known. That is that diligence leads to success. That's true in school, it's true in our work, it's true in our relationships, and it's also true as followers of Jesus. And so wherever you find uh, poverty in your life, one of the questions to ask is, are you being diligent? You know, it's really easy in our society to be super busy and yet not be doing the things that are most important to lead to success in the areas that are ultimately of most importance. I trust that you've been really encouraged and challenged by this proverb today and that you'll apply it this week sometime, whether at work or at school, in a relationship, maybe in your quiet time. The diligence leads to success because that's the way God's made this world. Hope to see you again real soon and God bless.